Now, Provost, Dean, thank you for that very kind introduction. Maria, thank you very much for the <laughs> parting those particular pieces of information. Um, I'd like to start by introducing you to the diary of Mark Little, aged 12 and 3 quarters. This was discovered upon a move, uh, when we're packing everything up to move back to Dublin back in 2012. And <clears throat> it was clear that I was transfixed at that time with measurements and predictions, um, as evidenced here by the degrees of luckiness scale, <laughs> um, which was established apparently by the daily roll of a dice. My dice was loaded because the uh, average each month was always over three. <laughs> so it's, it's clear that uh, for me, uh, it's always been about the data. Uh, indeed, the variability between these months tempted me to try and predict what was going to happen. And there's actually a faint pencil line there that uh, I, I try to predict what's going to happen with the dice rolls. Uh, clearly, I got it wrong. but. Um, <laughs> But we do stand uh, at a unique time in history um, where we have the uh, availability of data science tools uh, that give us unprecedented opportunities uh, to have deep learning about the social and biological processes uh, that uh, shape our uh, lives and shape our world. Uh, so this is a story about my uh, journey towards Bayesian statistics and <laughs> Uh, and artificial intelligence. But I must introduce uh, my uh, adversary for the last 20 years, uh, autoimmune ankyovasculitis, and, uh, and a date, April, 20, April 3rd, 2015. Uh, this is a very important date for uh, uh, Donald, we'll call him, it's not his real name. Uh, and we'll refer to him thereafter as uh, 2236, the, uh, this is the number from his RKD registry, his uh, ID. He uh, came to hospital on that day with uh, uh, a rash, a rash that developed rapidly and started rising up his legs. Uh, in addition, he had uh, shortness of breath and started to cough up a little bit of blood. Now, the, uh, the, the appearance of this rash was due to bleeding within his skin, uh, and the presence of blood within his airways and when he was coughing it up was due to bleeding into his lungs. He required a ventilator to uh, keep him alive at this point, uh, and his kidneys subsequently failed. Um, the doctors who were looking after him stuck a large needle into his back and took a little piece of tissue, and this is what it looks like. Um, this is a glomerulus. I was told not to use the word glomerulus, but I'll have to use it because <coughs> I've studied them all my life. Um, these are the little filters in your kidneys. You've got about a million in each kidney. Um, and this little area here is normal. The rest of it has been destroyed and replaced by an inflammatory mass of cells. Um, one of the main ones being a white blood cell called the macrophage, uh, which is shown here in brown. Now, this man has presented <laughs> with uh, a multi-system disorder affecting his skin, his lungs, and his kidneys. And the first clue, really, that this was not uh, his immune system was not reacting to some microorganism, but actually to a protein of his own body, was the presence of an antibody in his blood called ANCA. Uh, now, ANCA is an antibody that uh, requires its name, anti-neutrophil cytoplasm antibodies, because of the way that it binds to the most popular or the most uh, common cell in your blood, the neutrophil. And this is a picture you might see if you put neutrophils and uh, the patient's blood into a test tube together. We now know, of course, that these antibodies are directed against two, one of two particular proteins. First of all, these are proteinase 3, uh, short, uh, for short PR3, and myeloperoxidase, uh, MPO. And a lot of you may know MPO because um, of the green color of your sputum when you have a chest infection. Uh, that is due to MPO, which is bright green. Now, 2236 was very unlucky because he uh, was struck down by a very rare disease of which there are only about 50 or 60 cases a year in the country. This makes it very challenging to study um, as a disease because we don't have access to large numbers of samples or clinical data. But in looking after patients like 2236, 
I have come to have two big questions that I really try to answer with my, uh, with my research. Um, the first of these is, 62 years this man has been walking around, and he's been living with his MPO for all that time, and suddenly, out of the blue, at the age of 62, he suddenly develops an immune reaction, immune, uh, immune dysfunction that attacks his own cells. So what has caused his immune system to suddenly destroy his own blood vessels at this point? Is it something that he's met in his environment, an infection, or something else? And secondly, how do we um, restore this immune system to balance so that 2236 um, can thrive and uh, manage uh, without uh, immunosuppression? So that the antibody, the ANCA, disappears, uh, but the rest of his immune system is left intact so that he can fight infections and cancer. A little bit about my early days uh, in Dublin in the, in the 90s. Um, I am a nephrologist, uh, which means that I delight in uh, studying and playing with urine. <laughs> I'm also a clinician scientist, which means that I have a foot in the clinical and the scientific arena, um, which allows me to have first-hand uh, views on the clinical challenges uh, that cause uh, adverse health. Now, there are three people who were instrumental to my early decisions regarding nephrology. Um, uh, Michael Carmody, John Donoghue, and uh, Joseph Walsh, who I'm happy to say is here in the audience. Um, they introduced me to the data science or the data-driven specialty of nephrology with its graphs and measurements and laid the path uh, for me to study these little black things in the kidney, which are, of course, the glomeruli. Uh, and this path led me to the UK uh, and the wonderful NHS for 14 years. And I'd really like to acknowledge three people, um, as mentioned by Professor McCarran already. Um, first is Professor Charles Pusey <coughs> from Imperial College in Hammersmith, who introduced me to the intricacies of ANCA during the course of my PhD. Um, secondly, Caroline Savage, who helped me bridge that difficult gap between postdoctoral fellowship and um, independent scientist. And thirdly, uh, my partner in crime in UCL, in Royal Free Hospital, Alan Salama, um, uh, a font of brilliant ideas and uh, a really trusted sounding board. Now, my early uh, investigations into ankyovasculitis really focused on the effect the, that the antibody has on the white blood cell, what molecular events happen within the cell when the cell attacks the, the neutrophil. And for example, in this case, when you immunize with myeloperoxidase and raise antibodies to it, um, and this real-time intravital microscopy video of a small blood vessel, as you can see, that cells are sticking, these white blood cells are sticking, and migrating through the blood vessel wall. And an occasion, um, in fact, causing blood vessel destruction, reduction in blood flow through that little blood vessel on the bottom left, um, and bleeding in and around the tissue. And this is the, the same process that has caused uh, the bleeding into the lungs and the feet that I showed you. <coughs> Now, I returned in 2012, um, as Professor McCarran mentioned. I was very lucky when I came back to be awarded the Science Foundation Ireland President of Ireland Young Research Award, which provided uh, the resource to allow me to set up my own independent research group. Now, during that time, <coughs> I became a little grayer of temple. I went through five Movembers <laughs> and <laughs> All the time, I watched Professor McCarran's eyes narrow <laughs> as the time to my first or over lecture became longer and longer. <coughs> but I'm delighted to say that it finally came around. Um, I had the opportunity um, at that time to establish the Trinity Health Kidney Center with support from my uh, colleagues. And I'd really like to uh, acknowledge here the support of Tala Hospital and also um, Peter Lavin, Catherine Wall, George Mallet and Brenda Griffin, and also of Peter Conlon from Bowman Hospital. One of the infrastructures we established uh, during this, this time that uh, helps us to uh, address some of the big problems that we want to uh, study in ankyovasculitis is the rare kidney disease registry and biobanks. Uh, it's funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And because each individual hospital really has very few cases, um, we took the view that we need to enlist the help and the grace and favor, really, of lots of consultants and junior doctors, too many to mention here, um, to study this disease across the whole of the country. Um, and this has allowed us to accumulate and recruit 
um, over 600 patients with uh, ankyovasculitis, uh, along with their clinical data uh, and their linked clinical samples. Now, one of these recruits is 2236, and <coughs> he was kind enough to agree to give us his clinical samples and his clinical data. Uh, now, he did quite well after his initial presentation, uh, with, treated with heavy-duty immunosuppression, and managed to recover his kidney function so that he didn't need dialysis anymore. And he did okay between uh, then and now, um, <clears throat> despite having to take ongoing immunosuppression drugs because this disease has a penchant for coming back. Um, now, this happened until July, or sorry, February of 2017 when he became unwell again. Again, he became short of breath. Um, he'd lost a little bit of weight. He had some joint pains. Uh, and there was a slight change in his kidney function and there was a little bit of blood and protein on his urine in, in the dipstick. Now, the normal state of affairs when this happens is that we do another kidney biopsy, stick a needle in the back, um, uh, to have a look and see what the tissue showed. Now, the presence or the ac access to over 600 patients with serial samples uh, and data has allowed us to study a specific protein. Uh, this is one of, the, one of a couple that we've studied, but this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, it's a CD163. This up here is a normal glomerulus. Um, with very little stain of CD163, which is in brown. This is a glomerulus with uh, early ankyovasculitis with a few cells staining positively with the, with the protein. And this is uh, the one we saw previously, which is full-blown ankyovasculitis causing the kidney destruction and loss of kidney function. And interestingly, the protein disappears as the disease is treated um, and uh, is not seen anymore when the, when the disease gets into remission. So this... <coughs> is the kidney biopsy of 2236. And what struck me really was that this brown area here is in direct communication with the white area, which is, becomes urine. And it led me to wonder whether uh, measuring this protein in the urine would actually give us a window uh, onto the glomerulus and tell us what the load of these um, brown staining uh, macrophages might be. Um, <clears throat> now, needless to say, this is what we found, this is what we discovered. And this is the measurement of CD163 in the urine. Um, these are patients who have kindly been recruited to the rare kidney disease uh, biobank. And uh, these groups here, these are patients who have active uh, kidney vasculitis at the time of the urine sample. These have active vasculitis, but not in the kidney. And both of these groups are in remission. Now, the, um, you can see here is that the, the, the level of CD163 in these three groups is virtually undetectable, whereas there's a very high level in the patients with active vasculitis. Now, it's very important with these scientific results to validate them in another cohort, again, provided by the Rare Kidney Disease Biobank. And uh, so this validation cohort, again, showed uh, virtually identical findings. Now, when we tried to publish this, even though it was already the biggest biomarker study in vasculitis, they said, well, we, we need another validation cohort. So, we went back to the biobank again, and uh, another set of patients, uh, we analyzed their urine and found exactly the same thing. Now, it is important when we have a discovery like this that you go to a completely independent uh, place. So we contacted our friends in Groningen and asked them to measure CD163 in the urine, and they found uh, the identical finding. Now, this is um, all of the samples uh, that we've measured with CD163, and each one of those little <coughs> circles there is an individual recruit. Um, again, we see that the, the levels are very low in healthy people and in remission vasculitis and high with active disease. And this uh, was a sample that was provided by 2236 uh, when he presented again in February of 2017 with a little bit of a change in his kidney function. So the question really is whether if we'd known this value at that time, which we didn't, um, could we have avoided doing that kidney biopsy? And it is on that basis that we were able to uh, license this uh, technology to a German company called Euromune, uh, who have developed a kit, um, a quite a rare event to happen for a, a basic science um, finding uh, to be translated actually into a clinical test that can hopefully can help people uh, improve their management of patients around the world with ankyovasculitis and other forms of glomerulonephritis too. <clears throat> Now, I've found all the way along this path that uh, trying to do things in isolation doesn't really advance you towards your goal um, very much, and that you really need to make friends, uh, particularly with people who have different skills from you. So um, we have brought what we've learned from uh, setting up the biobank uh, to establish, first of all, a local um, uh, network 
if you like, uh, here in Tala Hospital called the Talavascular Synology Group with help with Stephen Lane. Um, and it's a clinical group that uh, gets various people together to help improve the care pathway for patients with bizarre, rare immune disorders, such as ankyovasculitis. This has led into uh, establishment of a, a national network called the Vasculitis Ireland Network, VINE, uh, in collaboration with colleagues uh, from some other hospitals in Dublin, uh, including St. Vincent's and St. James's uh, from Cork, uh, from Galway and from Northern Ireland. And I really must acknowledge here the input of the patient group Vasculitis Ireland Awareness who have stood beside us all the way along this path, informing our research uh, choices and ensuring that the patient is at the centre of all uh, of the research that we do. So panning a little further out, um, um, my, I and other colleagues have established UKVAS, which is the UK and Ireland Vasculitis Group, um, which runs a very large registry, which uh, recently uh, surpassed 6,000 recruits, uh, over 67 sites in the UK and Ireland, making it by far the largest uh, uh, collection of data for vasculitis in the world. So learning from these, we have um, uh, try to apply this at a European level, um, particularly under the auspices of the European Vasculitis uh, study group called UVAS. Um, and we've, I've attempted to amalgamate all of the registries across Europe. Uh, and with the Helical uh, Consortium, um, which seeks to ethically link uh, clinical data with research science findings uh, at a European level. Now, applying these um, networking attempts um, we have let's try to spread this out a little bit further to patients with all rare immune disorders. And, and with colleagues in Newcastle and Munich, um, we successfully applied to the EU for the creation of the RITA Rare Immune Disorders European Reference Network. And what this does is uh, provide people with access to expert care for these rare disorders all across Europe, no matter where they are, often via video link, because it is really not practical to have uh, experts in these uh, diseases in every city. Now, a lot of my career, I have uh, studied individual genes and proteins uh, from a molecular biology point of view. And this has been likened to a street um, where you are examining the ground under a pool of light. And I've often uh, been fascinated by what is also on the street when you turn the lights on, um, and what are the things, the, uh, if you're studying a disease in a patient, what are the things uh, you might learn by studying the, uh, the patient in the entire context of their environment. Uh, and one of the inspirations for this for me was the Cloudy with a Chance of Pain study uh, from Manchester, uh, which rapidly recruited 15,000 uh, people, um, and using their smartphones, um, and using the GPS in their smartphones um, to ask the question as to whether the pain that they feel in their bones is truly uh, due to the weather. Um, and because people entered uh, pain data into their phones, they were able to triangulate and link that to the weather data by the GPS in their phone. Um, this is not reported yet, but apparently uh, there is no link between weather. <laughs> don't, don't quote me on that, but uh, there's no link between weather and pain in your bones. So I have kind of wondered, uh, based on that, um, whether if I knew everything about all of the patients in the biobank at all times, uh, would I be able to study their diseases and gain new insights into, into what's happening to their immune system? I'm also interested uh, as to whether that statement makes anybody nervous in the room, um, bearing in mind, of course, that Amazon Google and Facebook are all doing this to you anyway. Um, but there are clearly ethical implications there. And um, it is by creating a partnership with Vasculitis Ireland Awareness and patient groups that we have um, created a trust, if you like, between us. And um, we have asked whether we would we mind if we, if we do that kind of thing. And uh, they, they have agreed to help us do it. So um, we have kind of just determined that 2236 in February 2017 on the basis of a kidney biopsy had a flare of his disease. And so what we're interested in now knowing is what triggered that flare? What was the thing that happened? You know, was it the same thing that triggered his disease initially? We'll never know that because we don't know about him before he was diagnosed. But we know who he is now and we can track him through space and time 
and work out whether there are some triggers uh, for this flare. And the key to this, of course, is the smartphone. Um, <coughs> and this allows us to obtain uh, location through uh, the use of GPS, um, activity data from the accelerometer in the phone, and also um, self-reported uh, feeling. How do you feel at this current time? It's a simple uh, questionnaires. Um, we also have the opportunity to link that data with the data from the biobank and registry, which uh, I've told you about, and also bringing all these huge, diverse data sources together. Uh, there's no way in the world <coughs> that I would be able to, able to do that. Uh, but people in the ADAPT Center and the, the School of uh, Statistics and Computer Science uh, in Trinity, and there are individuals there who actually uh, can do it. And so that's the basis of the chronic disease informatics group. So what happened? I'm interested in knowing what happened along this path uh, that triggered a flare of vasculitis in, this, uh, in, in 2236. Uh, was it something in the weather? Was it something in pollution? Uh, was it something, uh, an infection of some description? Now, there are online, granular, online, uh, time and location specific um, data available for download now by anybody um, that can help you to triangulate um, this flare event and see whether there are patterns in people who have had flare, about 50% of people in the, the whole biobank will have a flare. Um, whether they are different or their exposures uh, have been different to those who did not have a flare. And bringing this all together um, is the, really the domain of the ADAPT Center and the statisticians in, in Trinity. And uh, there are lots of different ways of analyzing this data, most of which is intelligible to, unintelligible to me. Um, uh, but a lot of it is based around Bayesian statistics and artificial intelligence, uh, which is quite kind of buzzword at the moment. And um, again, there are lots of different ways of doing artificial intelligence. This is just one neural net. Um, and the beauty, I think, of artificial intelligence is that because we have rare events, there are um, not many things to study, but each one that comes on, um, the, the, the system can learn. So with each new event, um, we can get more defined algorithms that help us predict uh, whether the person will have a flare event within the next three months. And that's our end game, really, here. That's our goal. Um, this is our computer, the kind of nominal computer screen. Uh, on the left here, we have some standard measures that doctors use to help, us, help them predict or guess, really, uh, what the risk of flare is uh, down the line. Uh, there's a couple of novel ones here, like our CD163. And on the right-hand side here, we're integrating the data uh, from our environmental studies and from the, the app-derived uh, patient-reported outcome measures. And putting all these together, deriving algorithms um, that give us a numerical value and a dashboard that tells us whether there's high risk, medium risk, or low risk of a flare in three months' time. And that, we hope, will help the doctor to decide whether to stop the drugs, increase the drugs, or leave them about the same. So to finish with, um, how have my degrees of luckiness uh, panned out uh, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years? Um, well, I've been very lucky over the, the path to uh, work with a, a wide range of fantastic people, not least uh, my current research group in the Trinity Translational Medicine Institute, and along with a couple of uh, prior members who have been really important uh, in developing the research uh, as we go. In the Chronic Disease Informatics Group, uh, doing that fiendishly difficult uh, data science uh, that um, will help us to uh, answer those questions with regard to the effect of the environment on triggering of autoimmune disease. The funders, of course, nothing would happen without them. Uh, Science Foundation Ireland, Health Research, Health Research Board, Vasquez Foundation, the Meath Foundation here in uh, Tala Hospital uh, have all been really important to developing this. But of course, most of all, uh, to my family, and uh, particularly to my parents, uh, without whom I would not be here uh, at the moment, obviously, uh, but who have made me really who, who I am today, and to my sister Cass, who has been an inspiration uh, all the way down the line. And of course, to my wonderful wife, Maria, who gave up so much uh, to come back uh, to Dublin uh, and to support me in my move back to a chair in Trinity, uh, and who really carries the, the weight of, of, of our family on her shoulders. And to my two little monkeys, Sarah and Maggie, and I'll leave you to meditate upon your data and 
who's looking at it now. Thank you very much.